I think the only thing that keeps this from being perfect is you don't have the San Francisco Giants ball game on the screen here. Other than that, this is absolutely ideal. Well, I welcome this opportunity to speak here. You are the second audience I've been able to speak to since I self-published this book about nine months ago. The first one was the National Cryptologic Museum Foundation at Fort Meade, which is an adjunct of NSA there, and they have plans to make their new cryptologic museum something that's almost on the par with Smithsonian, I would say. When I was 19 years old, I was faced for the first time in my young adult life with that famous fork in the road. Fundamental decision had to be made. Would I spend my junior year at Ripon College in Wisconsin, the way 99% of my fellow students would, or would I take the plunge and do what my German professor was really pushing me toward, going and living in Europe, studying at a German university for a year? So, 19 years old, what are you gonna do? Big fork in the road. And as the famous philosopher Schopenhauer once said, oh wait, was it, was it Yogi Berra? I always get those two mixed up. It was Yogi. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. And so I did. I took the road less traveled, you might say. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference, as the New England poet Jack Frost said. Um, you're going to sit here after all? That's perfect. That way I can get to the screen. Excellent. So I made that decision. I would, in fact, go to the University of Bonn. This became my home away from home for a year. Didn't exactly look much like Ripon College in Wisconsin, I can tell you that. A remarkable Baroque castle or palace is what it was, and it had some rather illustrious graduates before me, fellows by the name, you might have heard of a couple of these folks, Karl Marx, Heinrich Heine, Friedrich Nietzsche, Konrad Adenauer, Joseph Goebbels, and a fellow, I think I remember this guy, by the name of Joe Ratzinger. If I'm not mistaken, there was a guy by that name when we used to sit along the banks of the Rhine. We would go into the market and buy the biggest bottle of Lambrusco wine we could find. It was, I think, two or three liters, and it cost something like three marks, so a dollar. You know, Tuesday morning was a good morning for wine. And we would party hardy out there. Now, I'm not positive it's the same Joe Ratzinger, because the one I found in Wikipedia, that's the guy who would later go on to become Pope Benedict. So I, I, might, I might have a different Joe Ratzinger in mind. But I don't know. I mean, you know what, what happens in Bonn stays in Bonn. I loved it. I fell in love with Europe in general and with Germany in particular, where my life now was absolutely changed. It is no overstatement to say that that decision to spend that one year at a German university colored everything that would happen for the rest of my life. Had I made the decision to stay at Ripon College, I have no idea what my life would have turned out to be, but I can guarantee you I would not be standing here having a book to sell, talking to good people like yourself. It would not have happened. The only problem was I had made no plans for what to do after college. I came back from Germany, big man on campus, a senior in a fraternity, life was great, never hearing that tick-tock, tick-tock that May 1975 was coming around the corner very soon, and I would soon be out of a job, so to speak, in college. I would have graduated. What to do? I originally was going to be a teacher. I was going to teach high school German, but something trumped that. I wanted to get back to Germany. I just didn't know how. I'd do anything. I always joked I wanted to get back to Germany in the worst way possible, so I did. I joined the Army. <laughs> now, the Army was not my first choice. I, I knew nothing about the military, absolutely nothing. So I figured, let's see what we can rule out. Well, Navy, Navy's not going to have people in Germany because there's just a little bit of a coast, so they're out. Marines, I, I don't want to eat snakes for breakfast and stuff, so they're out. Uh, Air Force, this sounds cool flying around in a fighter jet, maybe putting on headphones and listening to people. Yeah, that's what I want. So I walked into the Air Force recruiter's office in San Jose, California, and said, I have a degree in German, I'm fluent in German, my Russian is not bad. Do you have any of those people that you send to Germany that they call linguists who wear headphones and, and do listening for a living? And the recruiter's response was two letters, no. Okay. So I went next door to the Army recruiter, told him the same thing, took the entrance test and maxed it, and the poor guy nearly soiled himself. Let me see if I got this right. You've got a college degree, 
and you want to come and be a PFC in the army here and be a linguist? I said, will you send me to Germany? He said, will you sign for four years? Sold. Now imagine my surprise, just to jump ahead in the story a little bit, after nine months at DLI studying Russian and advanced German, and then the summer of 76 at Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas, imagine my surprise to arrive at my assignment, Field Station Berlin, and see that a full 25% of all of the seats were filled by people wearing blue uniforms. Had that Air Force recruiter not been quite so stupid, the Air Force would have had me. And I'll bet you my life would have changed there too, because in the Air Force, unlike the Army, there was not this distinction between strategic and tactical assignments, and if you were good at what you did, the Air Force let you stay. There were people in Berlin who had been there nine years. As we'll find out in my Army career, that was not to be the case, and that really helped me make up my decision what I would do a few years later. So here he was. Our little army boy, you can see on the name tag, Estberg, and then RU, it tells you what your language was at DLI, came in as a PFC because I had a college degree, made spec four in 90 days, and because I finished at the top of my linguist class, I made E5 in one year. This is not bad if you can get it. Becoming a sergeant or a spec five as I was in one year, trouble was the minimum time to make E6 was four years, which means I never had to worry about promotion for the entire rest of my brief Army career. Is that going to keep going, do you think? Uh, yeah. That is. Okay, good. Well, then I'll just speak louder. Good luck for the camera trying to pick that up then. So I arrived in late 1976 at the brand spanking new airport in West Berlin, Tegel Airport. This was a one-of-a-kind, modernistic airport where every gate had its own baggage claim. You didn't go to a central baggage claim. Your bags were delivered to the gate you arrived at. Tegel Airport, little tiny one with all of three airlines, because in those days in Berlin, each of the Allies was allowed to have one. We had Pan Am, British Airways, and Air France. Tegel Airport remains Berlin's airport today. Their new airport is only 14 years and a few billion dollars behind schedule. And I used to joke and say that before I retire, I'll probably get a chance to see it, but that is looking highly unlikely. So I don't think I'll ever get to see what that new one will, like, will look like. What led to this book was what would happen to me over seven of the next nine years. And what you find if you read this book is a whole bunch of tales, nearly all of them true, there are only a couple I can't verify because I'm passing them on secondhand, but they were so good, I had to include them in this book. And what you find there is not too much focus on the day-to-day -day job details, for obvious reasons. Couldn't really say exactly what I did. But I was pleasantly surprised that when I ran this book through NSA's pre-publication review, they did not make me delete a single word or reference, even though there are some details in here as to what I was listening to when I wore those headphones, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Now, some of the content of this book, I have to admit, is a little bit juvenile, a little bit racy, a little bit bawdy and off-color, and if that doesn't boost sales when we're done, I don't know what else I can tell you. There's no nude pictures or anything, although there are a lot of pictures. There's about 15 pictures in there because that's what I was. I was young, somewhat immature, and yet I, like my fellow workers, recognized that what we were doing was critically important. And we were extremely proud of what we did because unlike our infantry and artillery and armor friends, all they could do was rumble around in training areas playing at what they would do if World War III broke out. We assigned at Army Field Station Berlin were not playing, we were not training, we were doing the identical mission that day that we would do if World War III broke out. The only bad news would be it would take all of about one artillery shell from the nearest Soviet military unit and there'd be no more Field Station Berlin. But until that happened, our mission would remain absolutely unchanged. So we were very, very proud, and I think that pride comes through in this book. Imagine being 23 years old, having a top secret security clearance and then some stuff, knowing that it was possible, if you were really, really lucky, that you might just be the guy listening to hear something happening like, uh, I don't know, Leonid Brezhnev dying, or maybe um, some incident at the border where it looks like hostilities might break out. You might be that guy. It could happen. 
And so it was exciting work for a 23, 24 year old, I tell you. And it was no less exciting as I got a little bit older and got to come back and become a civilian, what we call detached service officers, where I was in charge of about 40 military linguists to work for us there. But here it is. This is what the place looks like. I've actually got the blueprint drawing of it up here. Uh, I think we can agree the architect had a somewhat <laughs> curious sense of juxtapositioning here. And I picture, I wonder how many little boys in West Berlin got their wrists slapped by teachers who told them, I want you to draw a famous building in West Berlin. And all the poor kid was trying to do was replicate these, and she thinks he's a pervert and smacks him silly. No, I was just on the listening sites. That's all I was doing. But too bad for you. We all operated out of these buildings here. With, uh, we'll talk about what happened on the second and third floor. Our British friends had their own building, the Chow Hall that was built in the early 1980s. It was an HF antenna, a signal development area here, all our own uh, burn bag destruction facility, which was a lot of fun. You'd see people, everyone turned gray after that great detail, your entire uniform, your skin, your face, your hair, you were gray. You instantly aged 45 years. No windows, of course. Anybody in my line of work has to learn to deal with that. In a career of 39 years at NSA, I think I've had a window within 20 feet of me for all of seven or eight of those years, probably. It just doesn't come with the territory. Fascinating that our German allies, they have labor laws. No such thing is possible in Germany. I don't care what you do for a living. Every office will have a window. So that causes some considerations of its own. When you have a window and you've got all these classified devices all of about one meter away from the window. So what happened here? My first day on the hill, I was brought up there and uh, the warrant officer in charge of me said, hmm, you took the Russian transcription test, you did pretty well, but it says here, you know German, how good your German? I said, hell of a lot better than my Russian, sir. He said, we'll see, come with me. So he sat me down next to a civilian and I had no idea who the civilian was or who he worked for. And he said to the civilian, tell me if he's any good. So they had me plug my headphones into the tape recorder, TNH-11 at the time, and he started playing the seven-inch magnetic tape. Now, anybody who's been a linguist realizes, unless you're phenomenally lucky or good, you don't just let the tape roll. You've got what we call rock on it. You had foot pedals where you could rock and make the thing rewind over words you weren't quite sure about. But I would have been too embarrassed to have asked the civilian to do that, so I just had him let the tape roll. And at the end of about five minutes, he said, what were they talking about? I said, well, it was definitely a couple of East German Communist Party big shots, and they were talking about some meeting they're going to in Czechoslovakia, but there's some problem, and as a result, they're not going to be able to go for a couple of days. They're going to be late. So he turned to the warrant officer. He said, it's pretty good. He'll do. Warrant officer said, you're no longer a Russian linguist. You're a German linguist. Enjoy. Be up to work at 10 o'clock tonight. That is how I became a German linguist, and that's how my Russian career ended before it ever really got off the ground, before it started. When we weren't working, we had a rather unique work living environment, for us single people at least. This was my home. This was not our company commander, but this just goes to show you a little bit about the history of this building, which was built in 1878, the newly constructed German equivalent of West Point, only eight years after German unification took place located in Lichterfelde, in the Zehlendorf district, way in southwest Berlin, very close to where the wall would go up, just about a mile and a half from where that would happen. So significant was this West Point that after World War I, the Versailles Treaty specifically named this as one of the facilities that must be closed. And so it was, it turned into a regular school from 1920 to 1933, and new management took over. And in fact, it became a military training academy once again, as it had been in the 1870s. The SA and the SS both moved in. Apparently, the uh, building was not big enough for the two of them, as they say. And in late June 1934, many of the senior SA leaders, not including Ernst Röhm, the head, he was down at Tegernsee in Bavaria. Hitler went down to take care of him personally. But many of the other big shots in Berlin were brought to this facility lined up against one of the brick walls and shot dead. This would become known as the Night of the Long Knives in German history. And at that point, the SA was no longer a real factor to be dealt with in the Third Reich. The SS, on the other hand, now could take over the entire facility 
and this would become one of the most feared units in all of the German military. This was the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler. This was his personal death head SS bodyguard unit. These were people who went out into the East right after the war started and did some very, very terrible things. This was Zepp Dietrich's unit, among many, many others. And as the book talks about once, I actually had a couple folks at the gate one day ask if they could come in to look around. It turns out they'd been stationed here in 1936 and 37. I signed them in with the guards so that they could actually walk around and tell them a little bit about what the facilities were, were like in their day. Well, come 1945, the war ended. You can still see they needed to do a little bit of airbrushing up at the top of the building there to get the name off. The U.S. took over the facility from the Russians on the 4th of July, 1945. And for the next 44 years, many, many small units would be housed here, and it would be known as Andrews Barracks. This is where almost all single people assigned to Field Station Berlin lived. This was my home. Now, you wonder if I gave you the list of famous graduates from the university in Bonn, the list of the folks who attended the school here back in the earlier days is no less impressive. Gentlemen by the name of Ludendorff, Baron von Richthofen, Hermann Göring, Generals von Rundstedt, von Witzleben, and von Schleicher. It was a who's who of the Wehrmacht, all graduates of the academy here, which made it very odd when you thought about, I wonder who lived in my room. 40 years before me. This is what the barracks looks like today. It is now the home of the German Federal Archive. Uh, it's not open to the public. And if I, if I can pull any strings at any time before I retire, I would like love to get some German who knows somebody who knows somebody to get me permission to just go into this building one last time because it's structurally it's still sound. Um, but just to be able to walk those hallways once again, you'll see the inside of the building in just a couple of minutes. Now, back to the field station, Teufelsburg, T-Berg, The Hill, as it was called. We were a workforce of about 1,200 altogether, which was large, but certainly not the largest. Our friends down in Bavaria and Augsburg dwarfed us. They had 2,000 people assigned in Augsburg. We were 12% female and about, as I said, 20-22% Air Force assigned here, along with some Brits. The collectors worked on the third floor. We linguists worked down on the second floor, and the first floor was more of the administrative and the maintenance and functions like that. We never knew how good we had it in these days. If any of you have a SIGINT background, this was an HF microwave world. There was no GSM, there was no cellular, there were no free coppers, there was no low probability of intercept. What this means is, when these guys up on the third floor scared the antennas that are hidden in these ray domes, if you pointed it out toward East Berlin and tuned it up to 1,878 megahertz, it was 1,878 yesterday, it was 1,878 megahertz today, and it will be 1,878 megahertz tomorrow. Don't change a thing, just hit the record button and let the good times roll. That's, that was what collection was like for most of the subsystems in those days. Life was that simple for the strategic targets. Tactical guys, they move around a little bit more, but still not very hard. Encryption in 1979, still as good as unknown. Analog encryption would follow a little bit later, but analog encryption was, well, analog encryption. So we never knew how easy we had it. My job was actually monitoring East German Ministry of Defense. Strategic targets, we're talking about colonels and above usually. Now, I'm able to say that now because my target country has been gone ever since 1990, and that's why I was able through pre-pub review at NSA to be able to say that. I still was surprised because we have a lot of dinosaurs there, but they said that that's, that's okay. The fact that you monitored a communist country that doesn't exist anymore, no, no great secrets to be revealed probably in that statement. The tapes would be spun up on the third floor, and the rule was after 30 minutes you would rewind the tape, the collector, they'd put it in, a, in an orange or yellow tape jacket and send it downstairs to us on the second floor for processing. Now some of the collectors were also linguists, and I always felt sorry for them because their job was thankless. If they wanted to not listen to anything, they didn't have to. If they wanted to try their luck linguistically, they could write notes on what we call hand copy. And now they don't get to rock on it. They have to listen to it one time because it's being recorded live. 
But if they thought they heard certain words, they could put it on a little slip of paper, stick it inside the tape jacket, and when it came down, we would take that out. And if there was anything written on it, it could help us determine, should I do this one right away? Or maybe it's, it's subject for degaussing, which is what we do to the tapes that weren't very important at all. The tapes would be, re uh, sorry, would be rewound after 30 minutes unless it was in the middle of a conversation. But the rule was, even though the tape would hold more than 60 minutes of conversations, you didn't want anything to sit there too long. Because what if, in the first minute, somebody said, nuclear war breaks out tomorrow, but you let that tape run for an hour now. When the good stuff happened in the first minute, you've lost, theoretically, up to 30 minutes of time. So the rule was, 30 minutes, rewind, put it in the tape, send it downstairs for processing. My job, since I was kind of a crack shot linguist, I mean, gosh, not many army linguists had gotten to live in the country for a year and had a college degree in the language. My job was to go through this stack of tapes and do the triage, if you will. Listening, jumping ahead, listening, jumping ahead, and if it sounded as if it had some potential, that goes into do me first. Listening, saying, this doesn't look like it's going anywhere. And then once in a while you get a tape that would be just totally blank, and so you put them in the dig house with extreme prejudice pile. If you had that little hand copy, that of course could sometimes help you. One day, I was sitting there going through all of these things and pulled out hand copy and it looked somewhat important. It said Warsaw Pact meeting in L-O-D-Z. Well, Lodz, that doesn't even look like an East German city and it doesn't even look like Russian because I know Russian as well. This is ridiculous. The guy doesn't even know what he's hearing probably. So I put the tape up and imagine my surprise. Sure enough, Warsaw Pact meeting, but not in Lodz. How could the guy get L-O-D-Z? It sounded to me like Wutsch which really puzzled me because neither Russians nor Germans have the w sound, which has always puzzled me. Why does a Russian say, yes, I come from a very small village? Why did you say village when w doesn't even exist in your language, but the does? Just say village and you would, oh, well, I, I digress, that linguist humor. But in any case, it was not L-O-D-Z, it was Wutch. I looked through a gazetteer for East Germany and for Russia. I found nothing really all that close, but I put down something and then went on and did my transcript because this was a significant item, a Warsaw Pact meeting. The next day, one of the quiet civilians, Dave, called me over and he said, Rick, first of all, I want to compliment you. You've only been here for a matter of weeks and already you're, you're like the star German linguist among the army guys here. This is great. I said, well, thank you, thank you. He said, yeah, and I, um, I wanted to draw your attention to one tape here from yesterday. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the one where the bozo from upstairs put lodge, and it sounds like woods. I don't know what it is, but I know this is crazy. Yeah, um, he said, would you believe, or do you believe, that we NSA civilians have some experience on this job, maybe more than yourself? Well, of course, you guys are the gods. Yeah, sure. So that if we NSA civilians were to give you advice on a location or something you probably accepted at face value? Absolutely, sure, any anytime. Well, let's take this one for example. <clears throat> I did the hand copy on this one. Um, you probably don't know Polish, do you? I said, no. He said, well, here's the funny thing, that L with the line through it, that's a W in Polish, that's a W, and don't ask me why O-D-Z is Uch, but it is, the Poles have a great language, they just ought to learn to use vowels a little more often, I said, which? I've never heard of such a place. He said, well, follow me. So he took me over to a map of the Warsaw Pact, and of course, right in the middle is this massive city called Wutch, Lodz. There it was, right there in the middle. So I learned two lessons. One, a little hum humility, and two, learn the NSA civilian's handwriting so you don't do this in the future. It was fantastically interesting work, but it was stressful. When I felt like I have to, yeah, I do that. I have to be in charge of everything. I've got to get all these tapes done. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm falling farther and farther behind. And I couldn't understand, why am I getting headaches every day? Now in 1978, I don't believe the word stress was known in the English language. I don't think any of us, we may have had it, but we didn't know what to call it. We just thought we had a lot of headaches. And that's what I had. So I went down to the uh, clinic, the army clinic, and the doctor heard my symptoms and he said, have you ever taken Valium? I said, no, I've heard of Valium, but no. He said, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a Valium anytime you feel stress. I said, okay, fine. Next morning I come into work and there's the tape stacked up. 
So I take my Valium, put the first tape on, and start listening. The next thing I remember, or what I hear, is this. What had happened was, that tape had run all the way through onto the take-up reel, and now the take-up reel was just spinning wildly, which means that for at least the last 30 minutes, I had been sitting there staring at nothing and listening to absolutely nothing while the tape just kept rolling. So as I always joked, if somewhere in those first 30 minutes where there might have actually been intercept, if they had said, World War III breaks out tomorrow and you know it ended up being the end of our civilization, well, all I can say is, my man. Um, but I quickly learned that Valium doesn't really go well with transcription. Uh, so I decided to stop taking Valium. And I'd say that for times when I had a hangover or something. When I was there as a linguist, people would come and ask for my help. Uh, I'll never forget the case of a very young guy in there from Tennessee. First time away from home, first time away from the United States. Brand new to the Army, brand new to life. And he was going to get an apartment to get all set up so that when his young bride arrived from Tennessee, she'd be ready to go. Now, since he was an E2, he didn't have much in the way of a housing allowance, so the best he could afford was what the Germans call an Altbau. These were apartment buildings built around the turn of the 19th, 20th century, five stories high, some with elevators, most without, and then a rather unattractive courtyard leading to another building just like it behind it. Not very attractive places. He asked if I would come with him on a Saturday and help set the thing up because his wife would be coming in just a couple of days and he wanted somebody to just make sure everything was okay. So I said, fine. This was the first time in my life I had ever seen a skeleton key this large. I only had seen them in museums, but that actually was what you used to crank and open up the door. This was in, as I recall, late November. We opened the door and it is bitter cold in this place. A few things struck us within the first minute or two. First, and this remains unchanged to this day, no light fixtures just wires dangling from the ceiling. In Europe, the lights are yours. The wires stay, not the lamps or the light fixtures. Every new tenant, it's your job to do something to those wires. So there was precious little light, except that coming from the bathroom and from outside. And it was already mid-afternoon, so we had to make hay while the sun still shone, at least a little bit. It was bitter cold in the place. And something caught my attention in the living room. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, and as fate would have it, I had something like a marble in my pocket. And I dropped it onto the floor, and it picked up speed as it rolled toward the front wall. The floor was not even close to level. But that was the least of our concerns. We started walking around looking for the thermostat and found none. There was no thermostat. Just this large, very decorative ceramic box in the middle of the living room. Very, very glazed, very, very pretty. And we figured, wait a minute, I've heard of this, I said. I've read about this, like in Goethe. This is called a Kachelofen. This is where you put like coal in and it heats your house. He says, how do we do it? I said, I have no idea. So I said, wait a minute, we did pass a store down the street though that looked like they sell that kind of stuff. So we went down to the store and said, I'd like to buy some coal. And the guy said, how much? Six of those things. They're, they look about like a gold bullion brick, but they're, they're jet black, of course. Kind of like a big, big charcoal. So we bought six of them. Had no idea whether six would be too little or too much. Went back upstairs. He had a big lighter, and he tried to light one of these, and it would not light. So we got some paper, some crumb, put it under there, and tried to light it. Nothing. Go back down, all the way back down to the coal guy and said, how come this stuff, you know, this stuff's worked? It won't work, it's not working. And he said, well, you, you need to buy the little, I think the British call them punts. They look like little um, cones of incense. He says, you need to buy those too, and then put one underneath it lighted, and that will give enough continuous flame that the coal will start to light then. Okay, so we buy that, bring it back up. Now, how many of these things do you put in here? Well, by now, the room's down to like 40. So we put all six of them in there. All these. Well, I'll tell you, two hours later, that room was toasty. We were up there in the high 80s, I think. This was great. The trouble is, when we went to sleep there, woke up the next morning, we were back down to the 40s again. Now, the excitement wasn't over yet. Went into the bathroom. The sink was about this size, and above it was the hot water heater, which is about the size of one of those plastic water bottles that people carry around with them. That was the sole amount of hot water you could expect into that sink. There was a toilet with the drawstring. 
And conspicuous in its absence was everything else that's normally to be associated with the bathroom. Meanwhile, while I was noticing this, my friend was looking in the kitchen from the hall and his jaw was down. I came and looked. In the kitchen, the sink was about six inches bigger, so now for washing your dishes, the sink was about this big. The hot water heater looked like it might hold a gallon instead of a half a gallon. And conspicuous over in the corner next to the dining table was a shower. The shower was somewhat portable, and apparently there was a water hose that came out of the wall. For some reason, it didn't fit in the bathroom. I don't know, but it fit in the kitchen. So the shower was in your dining area. And I just, I just picture it. You know, you're inviting people over. You're having company over for dinner. Come on in. Make yourself at home. Listen, I'm just going to take a shower and freshen up. Um, would you just turn to, like, the other turn to the corner and don't look for a few minutes here? All I could think of was... Little Missy from Nashville has got some excitement waiting for her when she gets here. And I have no idea, I didn't remain in contact with you guys, so I have no idea whether or not the marriage lasted. But I'm going to say it didn't really get off on the right foot, probably. <laughs> so the tool of the trade that we used to do our business looked something like this. This is a TNH-21. Anybody who was a linguist in the 70s or 80s will remember these devices very, very well. The motors were put through a horrific stress because of that constant back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's no surprise that these things would break down like once every three or four weeks of use that way. But you had several tracks of audio you could listen to. Uh, and this is what you, when you'd, when you'd have a problem and you need help, you'd ask somebody to plug in, you'd call it. They'd unplug from their machine and plug into your machine. And now the two of you were listening together and the person could attempt to, to help you figure out what it was you were having trouble with. This was the state of the art for processing. We did our transcripts on manual typewriters, two-ply paper, we affectionately called it spy-ply. What you do is when you were done with your transcript, which had a lot of formatted things, like exclamation O-R-G, and then you'd space, and then you'd type the location. The computers back at Fort Meade, when they would see the exclamation point, that told them up a code of something is coming. PL was last name, ORG was organization, LOC was location, and this way the computers could tear the thing apart into its bits and bods and make some sense out of it for future retrieval later on. You give the two-ply paper to the NSA civilian, he would put up the tape. We didn't have any female civilians in these days, but we did by the time I left in the mid-80s. They would make corrections and such. You would then go in and type in the corrections, take this down the hall to the comm center. The comm center would then, using these old punch tape things, would put your transcript into a machine which would come out with this huge punch tape, which they would then feed through the machine, and then only these guys knew how to do this. They had a very, very special way of maybe making like a Möbius strip of this thing, and they would wind it around and hang it on a letter so that it could be retrieved later. If they never got the transcript, we just took the tape off and ran it through the machine again. This was state-of-the-art communications in 1979. This was how we did our work. It only makes you wonder, what did the East Germans have? <laughs> Probably a pony. You know, they, put, they put something on the back of a pony and he raced down to East Berlin or something to, uh, to deliver it. Now, one of the things, of course, that made Berlin absolutely remarkable was its location. And so I need to give you a little bit of Cold War geography here. Berlin, in 1945, not unlike Germany, was split into four occupation zones. Uh, a lot of people don't think about that with Germany as a whole, but East Germany was the Soviet part of Germany. We had the southern half of Western Germany, Bavaria, that's why so many American troops were all stationed in the southern part of the country. The French had a little tiny section at Alsace-Lorraine, and the Brits had the northern half of the country. So every one of the four occupying powers had its section, and the same was repeated in the city of Berlin. The Soviet sector, which bordered into East Germany, and the three western sectors of West Berlin. You can see the French have the northern part where Tegel Airport is today. You've got um, the British sector. Our site was right about here in the middle of the British sector in the woods, and the American sector, my barracks being down here in the Zehlendorf district. When the wall went up in 1961, you'll see it as the large black line there separating first west from east Berlin. But what a lot of people don't realize is only one third of the wall separated west Berlin from east Berlin. 
The rest of the wall all around the outer ring separated us in West Berlin from East Germany. So this was a little bit different. Potsdam, for example, where the famous conference was held, is in East Germany. So anything out here is the GDR, German Democratic Republic. Only the wall on this part led you to East Berlin. There were various checkpoints leading from West Berlin into East, some of which only Germans could use, such as number one. We never were allowed to go through that one. Number one would become unbelievably famous in early November 1989 when an East German border colonel could not get anybody to give him instructions after he repeatedly tried to get them on the phone, finally he said, to hell with it, open the gate. And that's how all that started. We happened to be there that very night, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. The famous checkpoint Charlie is right here, number five. That was for use by allies, diplomats, and the press. No one else. Germans could not pass through here. What made this different from traveling out to West Germany was here you were passing through East German guards. No Russians here. There were no Russians anywhere at these checkpoints. This was all East Germans. We, of course, didn't recognize the East Germans' right to do this. That's why Checkpoint Charlie was such an unusual circumstance. They were not authorized to ask for your identity card. You just put it up in the window. And they would walk by. They'd see your license plate that it was American. They would walk by and not even really look kind of like, I don't even need to look at your ID card. They did not scour it the way our MPs did before you went through Checkpoint Charlie. No Germans on the night of November 9th, 1989 came through Checkpoint Charlie because that wasn't one of their control points. They wouldn't have lined up there because that's not for their use. There is no control point at the Brandenburg Gate, as we'll see. Nobody could stream through there. You could try to climb up the wall and come over, but there was not a place for vehicles to drive through. No vehicles ever drove through the Brandenburg Gate from 1961 until 1990. It was behind the wall, actually, as we'll see. Tempelhof, the big U.S. military airport and then civilian airport, was the one that was just about closed when they opened Tegel in the 1970s. And this is where the Berlin airlift, all of the, most all of the flights landed today. It's probably the world's largest kite field, as people go out flying kites, and it's a huge park out on the old abandoned uh, runways out there. So to leave Berlin, you had three possibilities. One, you could fly out. This was horrifically expensive, and you only could fly on one of three airlines. Lufthansa was not allowed to fly. The Germans could not have any airlines coming into West Berlin. So it was either Pan Am, Brit Air, or Air France. It was extremely expensive. You could drive out. You had to get something we'll see in a minute called flag orders to make that happen. Or you could take one of the U.S. or French or British military trains. You could not take the civilian German train. The trains would depart each evening. The British train would go out through the center section, but the French and the American trains would come down, and there was literally, as we'll see in a minute, a hole in the wall for the trains to go through. For cars, it was the same way when you would drive through West Berlin out into East Germany, making your way 110 miles to the west, to West Germany. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. We had ample opportunity to see Russians, though, in the West. We didn't have to go to the East if we really wanted to see Russians, because they were to be found in many places. The top left picture is a Russian military liaison car. You can see the CA for Soviet Army just outside our PX. I often wondered what they thought, sitting there watching us coming out of the PX armed with big Kenwood receivers and Wedgwood China and all kinds of beautiful clothes and everything, and they could only think of what they have to go back to once their shift is over. The Russians, you gotta love them, the first thing they did when they conquered Berlin was build a couple of beautiful memorials to themselves, one of which, the most prominent, was in West Berlin. Knowing that that wasn't going to be their territory, they wanted to make sure that the Brits in their zone had a little something to remember them by. So the Soviets built this huge memorial to themselves. They built another even larger one in East Berlin. And on the anniversary of the October Revolution, they would come through the wall, Russians were allowed to do this, and have a huge ceremony in West Berlin. This was taken with a huge telephoto lens I had. This was as close as we were allowed to get to them. But the man in the middle, is a gentleman by the name of Army General Mikhail Zaitsev. He would not become famous, but he would have a very interesting situation happen to him a few years later on 
uh, when a member of the U.S. military liaison mission had some problems in Berlin. This is really the bridge. It's really there. You could really walk across it and drive across it today, but you sure could not in my day. The Bridge of Spies, made famous in the Tom Hanks movie. This is where Gary Powers was swapped in the famous, famous spy exchange. This is where Natan Sharansky, the Soviet dissident, was freed, and any number of lesser spies, almost always in the middle of the night, were crossed here. On the left side, this is Berlin, West Berlin. This is Potsdam. This is not what East Berlin. This is East Germany. So this is the city of Potsdam over here. And right in the middle was the demarcation line. Military people are very often off allowed to re-enlist pretty much wherever they want, as long as it's legal. And many, many of my friends re-enlisted right in the middle of the bridge there. And of course, there would be watchtowers. Can't quite see it in the picture. There's a big watchtower behind here mm -hmm. taking pictures just to make sure you don't do something like you know, stick your toe over the line or something. So it's still there today. I just, matter of fact, a week ago Saturday, drove across the bridge from the east into the west just to say I'd done it. I've never really done that direction before. Over just across here is where the Potsdam Conference took place at Sicilienhof and also the German version of Hollywood. Babelsberg Studios is just off to the left of this picture. Um, this was famous in the 1920s and 30s, probably almost on a par with Hollywood. And ever since reunification, it has grown once again to become a, a major world um, film producing site. The most famous checkpoint though, of course, was this one, Checkpoint Charlie. This is taken from the, in the day. You can tell why. I mean, we see a guard tower. We see a bit of the wall right up against the building here. We see no traffic whatsoever. This was taken at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning. And of course, the famous, you're now leaving the American sector here. What we Americans would do when we wanted to pass through, we would stop in our military van. We had to get out of the motor pool, show them all our ID, and tell them where we were going and when we would be back. Now, this is long before cell phones. I have no idea what would have happened if we had broken down in the middle of nowhere in East Berlin. There was no phone communication between the two. I have no idea what we would have done. I'm sure it was in the little booklet somewhere, but I don't recall what, this, what the stipulations were. You just hope and pray it wouldn't happen to you. But it did happen to me. And I'll talk about that in just a second. I'll give you one more view of this. Now you can see the guard tower, you can see the wall. Cars have to pass through this little tiny, tiny thing here. Tour buses would not fit through there, and pedestrians would come through here. Very, very unfriendly East German guards would process your paperwork if you were a tourist. That's where I came through as a college kid the first time. But again, we in the military more or less passed through untouched, unmolested. We had to come to a stop, but that was it. They just walked around the vehicle and then off we went off to do our thing. We were, in fact, in East Berlin, making an afternoon of it one day. Got back into our van after doing a little shopping, and there were five of us. Myself, a warrant officer, my girlfriend, who was a spec four, and this is interesting, a black female sergeant, and I don't honestly remember who the fifth person one was, but that doesn't matter, because these are the important four people. The East Germans and the Soviets had a mental picture. They had been told as to how minorities were treated in the United States, to include women. The rule was an officer, a well, white officer, of course, White enlisted, white female, and then any people of color just down at the bottom. This is what had been drummed into them. This is American society. When we got out and would walk around together as a group, the five of us, the eyes, the stares, the jaw dropping, because we were all talking as equals. The warrant officer wasn't you know, just standing off by himself. We all were communicating. We all worked together. We knew each other that one fellow came up out of nowhere. You could see he was nervous. We were in a large square, large open square. He came up to us and whispered as loud as he could, or as loud as we could hear it, Americans good, Russians shit, and then he ran away. <laughs> that took a lot of guts on his part, I think, to actually do that. But we were getting back into our van, now to move on, and Ward Officer Dave, the driver, hears, the van wouldn't start, it was dead, absolutely dead. Now all of our eyes got huge, thinking, oh my God, we have plans to eat at this beautiful Hungarian restaurant tonight. Oh no, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? Dave and I both spoke German. 
So we said, we're going to go and see if we can find, maybe there's a car mechanic place up the street or something here. You're not really supposed to ever make contact with an East German, but we really, really wanted to have that nice dinner. Went, and lo and behold, two blocks away, there was like a little taxi place, and the hood was up in a little Trabant car, the little two-stroke, 25-horsepower German vehicles made of some kind of fiberboard, I think. And the guy looked up and noticed us in uniform, and of course his eyes got huge. His name was Gerhardt, and we asked, could you come with us and take a look and see if you can fix our Ford man? So he said, yeah, sure. So he comes back with us, and all the while, we're all thinking, this is the oddest day we've ever had. All of us were thinking this. He tries it, and of course, he says, it sounds like your battery. Where is your battery? We said, you know, it's funny you mention that, because we thought the same thing. So we opened up the little thing in the back, and there's an engine, all right, but we couldn't, we're not all mechanics. We, I said, we're not mechanics. <laughs> there's no battery back there. So we went to the hood and opened it up, and it's nothing. There's just nothing up there. We said, where else can a battery be? He said, it might be under your driver's seat. What? I said, yes, that's where you put it sometimes. What? So we lifted up, and sure enough, there's the battery. Took off the little caps, bone dry, Sahara Desert. The motor pool had sent us out into East Germany with a van with a dry battery. He said, no problem. He went back and got some water, put it in, and <coughs> it started up just fine. Then he strikes up a little conversation with us. <coughs> He says, now when you people go back through Checkpoint Charlie, is it correct what I've always been told? The East Germans don't stop you. They can't. I mean, you just go through. That's right. Hmm. So no one stops you or checks you at all. Already I'm hearing this horrible music in the back of my head. My eyes are getting huge for like the third time in an hour. Uh, I said, what are you saying? Uh, well, he says, I have family out in the West. Um, don't ask me how they got there, but I have family. I'd love to be able to go see them. Um, we need to tell you one little thing. It's true, the East Germans don't stop us, but the MPs, our own MPs do. They come aboard the van to make sure we haven't like bought all the lettuce in your country and stuff, because some Americans are stupid and they do things like that. Uh, we, we can't do that. And he said, I, I don't know. He said, hey, it was a one in a million opportunity. You were here, I had to ask. He said, it's okay. And you could see he was kind of depressed. Well, we felt terrible. Here he had saved our bacon. So we quickly all chipped in and gathered up about 50 Westmarks. A 50 Westmarks in these days was about $15. 50 Westmarks to him would be about a month's salary. With Westmarks, you can buy certain things that East Germans can't normally buy. So we, in effect, tipped him about a month's salary. Think about getting that if you, you know, work in a restaurant. The tip is a month's salary. But that is a memory that's all described in great detail in the book that I will absolutely never, ever forget. And I wonder, hopefully, when the wall came down 10 years after that, hopefully he had some interesting stories to tell his family when he could be reunited. What I'd like to do is propose we take a very brief pause here. Nobody's fannies or voice or anything else can stay focused for two hours without a break, I think. So what I'd suggest, I'm not saying which part is the most important, but what I'd suggest we do is just take a brief break of maybe 10 minutes. It's 5 to 3. We'll come back at 5 after 3, and that's when the story gets really exciting. Okay? All right, so thanks. Okay, there.
round two. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the remarkable, unique kabuki dance that was called driving from West Berlin out to West Germany, a hundred miles through the corridors, we called it, out to the zone. These were 1940s words that just were used all the way through the entire time. When you decided you wanted to drive out 110 miles through East Germany, here you would get to meet some Soviets, no more East Germans. We did, not, uh, we did not recognize their right to even talk to us, only Soviets, when we were going through East Germany. The first stop you'd make would be Checkpoint Bravo. I was here eight days ago. The building is still here. This is getting very, very faded, but the sign is still very legible. Checkpoint Bravo. You would pull off here. I'll stop. You would go upstairs and get a travel booklet that would give you all these instructions, where to turn. We did not want you ending up in Poland. What to do if you sped, and very strict rules. No going faster than 100 kilometers an hour, 62 miles an hour. Pretty easy to tell if you speed. You get to the other end, 100 miles, and if you make it in one hour, mm -hmm. they realize somebody's been going a little bit too fast here, and then you get in big trouble with the MPs, if not the... East Germans probably couldn't keep up with your car. They'd have to call the Soviets and put up a roadblock ahead of you or something. But in any case, once you left here, you were now passing into East Germany. And I recently found a remarkable picture that actually shows it from the other perspective. Up at the top, this is West Berlin. Here's Checkpoint Bravo. And the minute you leave here, you're now getting ready to go into East Germany. You can see the wall. You can see there's a big hole in the wall. But the hole in the wall is for people entering East Germany. If you're down here, you're in East German. You've got a wall. There's no way for you to get from here onto this highway. You are blocked completely. 
The road is only for cars entering or exiting Berlin. Now the backlog is all these cars coming into Berlin. I'm not too sure why they're all having to stop here. Something's going on. But what we would do is, once we got our paperwork, we would very slowly drive here and just off the picture, there'd be a lane that says allies. We would go off to our own little checkpoint. All the Germans and the trucks and all the businessmen driving through would process through the East German checkpoint because they were going through the country of East Germany, not the Allies. We only dealt with Russians, except when you go through like Checkpoint Charlie. So here we would deal only with Russians. You know, it's interesting, I was told that somewhere when you enter the state of Tennessee, the welcome sign as you leave the airport from one of the cities says, death is the wages of sin. I guess that's their down-home way of saying howdy, y'all. I mean, I just don't understand that. But in any case, how do the East Germans say welcome to the workers' paradise by mounting a T-34 tank here? I mean, if that doesn't make you feel welcome and only nothing does. So there's a Soviet T-34 tank saying, I hope you enjoy your stay very much. <laughs> off you go and pull off at the Allied checkpoint. Now, the driver gets out of the car. The driver will have with him the thing on the left called the Puchovka, flag orders. The driver will gather up his or her and all the people in the car, and only the driver gets out. This will become important later on in the story. The driver gets these, walks out to the car, up to a Soviet private in uniform. How many of you can say that as U.S. military or U.S. civilians, you in civilian clothes have saluted a Russian enlisted person? I can say I've done this many, many times. You hand him the papers, you salute, he looks at them as if he knows English, he hands them back and points to this little shack and says, Peugeot! So you go into this little shack, this little prefab shack, and there's a little slot there for you to put the papers in. You put the papers in and these hands take them away. Then you're there to sit and wait your turn, wait a while. They have some very cool reading material here for you. I mean, we're talking page turners. Leonid, Leonid Brezhnev's speech on farm improvements in the last quarter of the year. I mean, this is all good, good stuff. And it's there in English and in Spanish for our Hispanic military friends. And free of charge. You can take it with you if you want. I mean, come on. There's a little black and white TV tuned, of course, to an East German station. You wait, and then in the back you hear this and then the papers come back. Now you take the papers, which have been suitably stamped, this, you take them back out while the people have been waiting in your car, take them back to the Soviet, he looks at them, looks at the stamps, gives them back, he salutes you in your car, and off you go. Now, of course, it was obligatory. Anyone assigned in Berlin was expected at least at some time in their first year to make the obligatory purchase of one Soviet belt buckle. This was a real kabuki dance because you didn't want to really flash money, you didn't really want to flash the thing, but at the end of the day it all worked out fine. Although Lucy wondered once when I got into the car and I handed her the paperwork, which was a little thicker than normal, I said, don't open the papers, don't touch the papers till we're out of here. She said, why? I said, don't, just ch -ch -ch. And we drove down the road a few miles and she could look in here in the middle of the papers with this big Soviet belt buckle, which I still have and of course have never or done anything with it, it just sits there, but I have one. That's, that's the important thing. Off you go, driving through East Germany off to West Germany. If you took the train, this is the instruction. You'd also have to have Puchovka. Those you would give to the U.S. conductor on the military train, if it was the U.S. military train. There were two of them, a small one that went to Bremerhaven. You'd take down usually just to pick up your POV, your vehicles that would come in, and then the one that would go all night and take you right into the Frankfurt main train station. You'd, you'd stop the train here, Soviets would check the paperwork. You'd go through the night, stop again at checkpoint Alpha, Soviets would check the paper. You'd, there was nothing for you to see. You'd already given up your paperwork, there was nothing interesting. And then through the night you'd go, and in the morning you'd be in Frankfurt. Notice the rules here, as I highlight in my book. It's rule G that really killed me. Damn! I really wanted to jump off a moving train in the middle of the night in East Germany. And now you say, I can't. Thanks, thanks. You ruined it for everyone.
And so one guy did it once probably, and great, now we got a rule nobody can do it. But that's really, really what I did want to do. Unfortunately, never got a chance. This is another way of showing you all of the ways from Berlin out to the west. This includes the routes that West Germans could take that we could not. We could only take the one from Berlin out to Helmstedt Marienborn, the central corridor. Germans, West Germans, could take this lower one or the upper one. So that would be German trains, German trucks, German tourists, but not we allies. We could only go this route, no other one. And we could go by military train or personal vehicle, that's it. No other options, no German trains. But you can see there were multiple routes. You can also see how West Berlin is an island sitting in the middle of East Germany. The gray on the left, that's West Germany. This is East Berlin, and just off this side would be the Polish border. And of course, you go in Poland a little bit, and you find this big town called Butch. So, <laughs> we liked to protest uh, in the army. We were part of the volunteer army, the newly created volunteer army. Vietnam had been over for a few years. Some of the people I was in the army with were a little bit like Goldie Hawn in Private Benjamin. I think they were expecting their own private yacht or absent that. I mean, probably Navy, that'd be Navy enlisted. Um, army enlisted, probably your own tank, you know, an Abrams tank or, or something very cool, a penthouse, something like that. Well, that's not what we got. We got a 100-year-old barracks with horrible plumbing, leaky pipes and everything else, but some people rebelled. We also, a lot of us rebelled. It's just how far did you take it? My book talks about a couple of the rather outlandish ways that people rebelled, such as smoking dope in the barracks. Um, folks, here's the rule. In case of a tie, the army always wins. What do you think you're protesting and what do you think is going to happen when you get caught? Not if, but when you get caught. Um, I really can't quite see the upside of that protest movement. We chose to make an underground newspaper. The rule was it had to be tasteful, sort of. It had to be honest, somewhat and it had to make everybody laugh a lot. And it had to start with a title. We had to come up with something clever, so we labored over this, my roommate and myself, and we came up with the Teufelsberg Tampoon. And this was a piece of history at the field station in Berlin. Everyone was fair game, especially people who outranked us, which was almost everybody. Uh, NCOs, officers, and of course even field station commanders, such as the gentleman here, we would change the names always. For us in the newspaper, he was known as Colonel Dallas Brown. His real name was Colonel Houston Green. Um, actually, I have it backwards. Houston Green is what we called it. Dallas Brown was his real name. So it was never very hard to figure out really who you meant in any of these things. Uh, I did most of the writing. That's my lawsuit. My roommate, Harry Maturney, did most of the artwork. That was his lawsuit. If we tried to switch roles, it would have been a disaster because all the pictures would have been stick figures and it just would not have worked well whatsoever. We poked fun at everybody, especially junior officers. They were the butt of all of our jokes. We got a new company commander who came in, a captain. He had been over across the street, over there in the infantry barracks, and he was a chemical weapons officer. You can imagine what we did with that, about how his job was sniffing out bad smells, and so we came up with all sorts of scenarios for things for him to smell. We were absolutely cruel to this man before we even got to know him, but I mean, that comes with the territory, I guess. The heck of it was, the more we got to know our new company commander, who in our paper was affectionately known as Dick Quatsch. Quatsch in German means rubbish, trash. The more we learned that we actually kind of liked the guy. It was really hard to dislike him. And we thought, now we're stuck. We've got to lampoon the guy, but damn, he's a nice guy. So we ended up going a little bit lighter on him at least. Years later, I would learn from him and from his wife. His wife was not too happy to read some of the articles that I had written about her husband. He took it all in stride. She did not. And it took a while before we uh, actually had a mending of the ways, I guess, and she uh, accepted my apology on behalf of her husband, I think. The gentleman who became known as Dick Kvach is the man on the right-hand side of the picture here. His correct name is Dick Quirk. He was a captain when I knew him. He would later on go on to get two stars up here and would become the chief of operations at NSA. One of the nicest men I have ever known. For those of you who weren't in the army in these days, fatigues were something absolutely unlike what you see today. 
Fatigues were meant to be rigid and starched to death. I've never, I have no idea how you starch things. I know you spray stuff, but this, this is industrial starch. When you would get your pants back from the table, from the cleaners, the pants would literally stand up on their own if you just put something to keep them from falling left or right. They would stand four feet tall right there. When you put your leg into them, you intentionally put it in as gently as possible because you wanted to maintain the crease. The longer you maintain the crease, the less often you had to go and get them laundered and get the starch back again. So that if you were careful, you could wear one pair of fatigues for maybe a week straight. If you were not careful, the minute you lost that crease, now somebody's going to complain and you're going to have to go get them redone. But you can see here, the spit shine, the shoes, the creases, my gosh, this was definitely Captain Quirk's good day. He didn't always have good days. Probably one of the most interesting chapters of the book talks about what I call Captain Quirk's worst day. And it began this way. I believe that very sexy guy walking down the hall of the barracks is me, getting ready to turn into my room. I had a single room right in here, and I happened to be working a different shift from everybody on the hall for a while. It was very difficult to balance shifts and where people live. I had my door open, it was quiet, the hallway, and I heard some strange hissing sound. Not nearly that loud, but just this little hissing. I looked in the hall and didn't see anything. And it kept up, and I thought, this is crazy. And I started walking down the hall. And when I got down to the next door down, there was this brown water oozing out from under the door. And it was hot. What the? I figured the radiators cracked. The radiators, folks, were 100 years old in here. I ran downstairs and got Captain Quirk. He and the first sergeant came upstairs with me. They had the master key, opened it up, and what a scene. Turned on the lights. The radiator had burst and had this beautiful fountain, and the brown water was going straight onto the serviceman's bed, where he foolishly had left his guitar in that day. So this boiling water is going all onto it. The floor now was already this deep with water. All of the shoes laid out decoratively under the bunk. It was the creepiest thing. They're all bobbing in the water. All these nice fresh shoes were just bobbing there in two or three inches of water. The first sergeant tried to shut off the valve and scalded his hand and he realized, this isn't going to work. we got to go down and turn off the, the main valve. So we ran downstairs, past the first floor, down into the basement, and really without so much as much of a knock, they used the master key and opened the room there. Here was a young sergeant sitting in his underwear on his bed, weighing out dope, marijuana packages here. He said to the first sergeant, you stay here with him. We're going to call the MPs upstairs. Rick, you come with me. So back, Sergeant Esper, back upstairs we go. And as, we, as he's calling the MPs, I wanted, one, I wondered, I wonder what's happening to the ceiling right below that room. And went into our rec room and looked. The entire ceiling was starting to cave in the middle. It was no longer flat. And what was right underneath the water was dripping through onto the neon lights. I said, oh my god. So I ran back and got Captain Quirk off the phone with the MPs and said, look, I think it's going to cave in. I think the second floor is going to collapse to the first. Now he said, you call the engineers, the EDH engineers, get them out here. I'm going to go call in. This, this day, this all probably happened in a half hour. It seemed like 10 hours. And I'm pretty sure that Captain Cork would say this was among the worst days probably of his uh, entire career. Here's another fellow that I worked for. And as it says, even the blind squirrel finds the nut once in a while. I must have gotten some award here. The man who's handing out the award to that handsome sergeant is Colonel Chuck Eichelberger, field station commander from 1978 to 1980. He would go on to get three stars on his shoulder, and if I'm not mistaken, he had an office just down the block from here at Bentville Farm, probably, as the commander of INSCOM, or he may have been the Dixie in the Army in the uh, Pentagon. He was former enlisted, so we kind of liked him a lot more. When he was field station commander, this is just in 06, in Berlin, his house that was given to him was the house that used to belong to Admiral Karl Janitz of the Third Reich. 36 rooms, and as uh, Colonel Eichelberger would write in his memoirs, the kitchen was 55 feet long. Not bad digs for an 06. When I was there as a GS-12, I had a duplex with a Steinway grand piano in there. That was as a GS-12. So life was, was pretty good living in Berlin, I would have to say. In 1979, I would get out of the Army because I loved the work, but to be honest, I hated the Army. I didn't like the way I was treated. 
The Army's theory was we're going to treat everyone at the lowest common denominator. You're all soldiers in our eyes. We don't care how good you are at your technical skill. Even worse, it was made clear to me by people who want to know, if you realize, Rick, your assignment here is going to end. You're not going to Augsburg. You're not staying here. You've got a tactical assignment in the near future, my friend. If you're lucky, it'll be at Fort Lewis. If you're unlucky, you'll be at Fort Hood, and you'll be there for three years. I said, what am I going to do as a linguist there? Listen to old tapes, but mostly you'll be washing trucks, things like that. No, this can't happen. So I announced my intention to get out of the Army. Only when I did that could Jim Cusick, the civilian who was that man I sat down to the first day, say, all right, then I'm authorized to say this. Come work for us. You get to do the same work, you'll make three times as much money, and people will occasionally treat you with respect. <laughs> so, that said. So, came to NSA and began work in early January 1980. Rushed in late to a security briefing that day, first day of work. Only one seat left in the room. I sit down next to this lady in a green dress, who happens to be my wife. <laughs> a marriage made at NSA. We met at a security <laughs> briefing as we got our clearance on the first day of work, January 7, 1980. We would go back to Berlin in 1982, because that's really what I wanted. This time I didn't have to go back in the worst way possible. I knew I wanted to go back and be one of those civilians in Berlin. So we returned in 1982 and I would be there for four years as a civilian. I talk about some of the adventures that we had as a civilian there. Uh, there were a couple of things that happened that were not so pleasant during that civilian assignment. As a matter of fact, three of them. One of them affected us very personally, one indirectly, and one not very direct at all, but it's a tragedy just the same. The one that was indirect was this one. Not too many of us in our career can say that they sat 40 feet away from a spy for two years. I did. And as fate would have it, this man, James Hall, was taking every report I was writing and was making sure that the Soviet Embassy in East Berlin got a copy of it. In my anger, I was mentioning this to someone, and they said, Rick, you could have saved everybody a lot of time and trouble when you wrote your reports. Just put from Army Field Station Berlin to NSA Headquarters, info, sov, M e Berlin, and you would have saved everybody time and trouble. He uh, would eventually get caught in 1988. He was stationed in Georgia and was doing things like paying for brand new Volvos in cash. Not something a warrant officer normally does. He was an E6 when I knew him here. He was uh, sentenced two weeks before the wall came down in 1989 and would serve 22 years of a 40-year sentence, calling himself a treasonous bastard. And I've never met anybody in our business yet who's argued with the man. The uh, second thing which happened, which was a real tragedy, was this one. This is kind of a complex story. I'll make it very short. Each one of the four occupying powers got to go into the other people's zone in military cars and military uniforms, with some exceptions. The Soviets could not go into the Grafenger training area, or Hohenfels. We could not go into their training areas. But you could go almost anywhere else you wanted. This was the U.S. military liaison mission, was headquartered in Potsdam, just across the Glienica Bridge. And one day in 1985, Major Arthur Nicholson was out driving with a sergeant up in Ludwig's Lust, way up in northern, western East Germany, taking pictures of Soviet tanks. It was legal where he was, but it was real close to where he shouldn't be. He was very close. A Soviet came upon them and shot him in the stomach. Did not allow the driver to give him aid. Uh, Nicholson bled to death there at the scene. This became the first international crisis of a very junior Mikhail Gorbachev's tenure as the leader of the Soviet Union and caused a huge, huge stink, as you can imagine. Uh, led to meetings between the usurer commander and his Soviet commander in Germany, and a couple of years later, only a couple of years later, would the Soviets actually issue a former apology. Nicholson is now uh, buried in Arlington Cemetery. But the third tragedy, the one that came, wasn't really, I shouldn't say it was a uh, tragedy, but the one that came closest to home. We were out in uh, West Berlin with our new son, nine months old, and it was winter, it was January. Uh, the sun had a bad case of diarrhea, and it was turning to snow. We really thought we should go home to Berlin early, drive through East Germany and get home, and a German druggist said, you really should. 
but the snow was getting worse and worse and worse. As we were driving through this blinding snow, we were rammed from behind by a West German truck. And it was a miracle that I was able to keep control of the vehicle at all, considering how hard he hit the car. This was a little Datsun B310 hatchback. And the, the force crashed in, accordioned in the back half of the car. Our son had been sleeping on the back seat, not strapped in or anything. He slept through this whole thing. Only when I stopped, got out of the car to talk to the truck driver and the little ding, 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 you know, when the doors opened, that woke the baby up. Turns out the truck driver, he would never admit this, but it was found later, had fallen asleep or had snow blindness. He was driving more hours than he should have. What I feared was getting back in. Thank God the car still drove. Was I had to check through the checkpoint now again. And what are the odds they're not going to notice this fresh crash? I get there, get out the paperwork. Lucy stays in the car with the baby. Now the accordion back was such snow was falling into the back of the car through the now crushed opening part. So it was very, very cold. I went in. Put in the papers, who's all with it, waited, and then I hear I'm saying, oh no, I'm hearing him. He's saying that it appears this car has been in a crash recently. What you never wanted to have happen was the door open up and the officer come out. You never wanted that, because that would normally mean he's going to try to recruit you. And if that happens, they'll normally, keep, our folks would kick you out of Berlin immediately. You never wanted to see them. The door opens up and out comes a Soviet captain with a mustache. The only Soviet officer I ever saw with a mustache. He said, Gewerite uh, Boruski, Sprechen Deutsch? You always in our business had to dumb up. Never would you admit that you knew any foreign language because that pretty much gave away where you must work. And again, we didn't really feel like striking up any conversations or friendships. He said, you will come, come. The amazing thing is when you're trying to pretend that you don't speak a language, you almost turn into speaking pidgin English yourself. He says, you are crashing? You say, no crash, no crash. Why, why didn't I speak English? I know there was not a crash. I said, I was hit, me hit by truck, truck, in back. Figuring that's how a Russian would speak English, I guess. He said, Soviet truck? No, 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 no. East German truck? No, 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 no. West German, BRD, BRD, Federal Republic of Germany truck. He says, hmm. Okay, so he goes back in the house. Lucy now rolls down the window and says, it's freaking cold out here. I said, I, I know, just, I don't know what's going to happen here. We're making this up as we go. So I go back into the little shed, and he goes in the back, and now I hear him calling his boss on the radio, thinking, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> then the door from outside opens up. Lucy walks in holding the baby. She's supposed to stay in the car. I said, what are you doing in here? She says, it is too cold. I am not going to let this baby stay out of that cold any longer. What happens next? The door opens up, and here's our Soviet captain again, now seeing three Americans in here. I'm going to do my best. The Soviet came out and saw the baby. He instantly changed his attitude completely. He took three steps and stopped directly in front of my wife, his eyes never leaving baby Charlie. He reached out his arms to Lucy and with a pleading look, asked her in Russian if he could possibly hold the baby. I furtively gestured to her to give him the kid. The officer didn't seem to mind this breach of protocol whatsoever since there was a cute baby involved. It's hard for me to describe the look of love in this Soviet army captain's eyes as he gently rocked our nine months old in his arms quietly saying something soothing in Russian, which I couldn't make out. It was probably a lullaby, something they definitely did not teach us at DLI in the Russian instruction. It's long been said that Russians love babies, and until this moment I wrote it off as propaganda, or at least as applying only to Russian women. This man totally proved me wrong. After three or four minutes, he gently returned Charlie to Lucy's arms and then turned to me. Pointing to his wristwatch and shaking his head, he said with a look of sadness, Sorry, minute, 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 sorry, sorry. He went back into the little shed, and it must have been another 10 minutes before the Russian radio loudly belched to life again. I strained to hear what was being said, and evidently the Russian authorities had checked out my story with the East German police, and they had not reported any indication of any accident involving any of their citizens, so it meant I was telling the truth. Not 15 seconds after the radio went silent, I heard the sweet sound of the stamp entering our departure time on the travel orders. For a final time, the door opened, and the captain personally handed me the stamped paperwork pointing toward the door and indicating we were free to go. 
As I recall, when I opened the door to leave, there were tears in all three sets of adult eyes. You know, it's very hard to hate someone when you get to know them, even if only for a couple of minutes. It might very well be that this officer was a highly trained intelligence official, not unlike myself. It might also be true that he had been very well indoctrinated to, at a minimum, be highly suspicious of the others, recognizing what a danger they posed, not unlike myself. And the two of us probably realized that in some apocalyptic worst-case scenario, we might find ourselves on a battlefield in the future, striving to kill each other. But that would have to wait for another time and another place. For now, we had most unwittingly formed a temporary, but never to be forgotten bond. A meeting of human emotion and an unspoken recognition that maybe neither one of us was quite the monster we were purported to be. This was indeed a very happy ending to a very difficult day. As for Charlie, he can boast of being one of an extremely tiny, tiny handful of Americans who can say that they have been held by a Soviet military officer and live to tell of it. Good news came to the end of that story, thank goodness. Well, in 1989, we were back in Stuttgart with a baby second child this time. It was Veterans Day coming up, and we decided to fly to Berlin for old time's sake. Little did we know when we booked those reservations on the 1st of November what would happen when we flew to Berlin on the 10th of November. When we got there, we were already reading the headlines of what had happened the night before, and you all know what had happened the night before. We made our way downtown and decided, let's take a taxi out to the Brandenburg Gate. Well, we made it about a quarter of a mile, and then the mass of humanity made it impossible. The taxi driver said, pay me and get out and walk, otherwise we'll be, you'll never get there. So that's exactly what we did. The brand newborn in a little stroller, carrying Charlie on our back, and off we went toward the Brandenburg Gate. It was just us, Tom Brokaw, British military helicopters, and about 100,000 of your closest friends, all out there at once. Nobody knew exactly what was going to happen next. Up on top of the wall were all of these East German guards, but they were not armed. And of course, one thing led to another, and before you knew it, by the time we got back to our hotel, there were East Germans everywhere. Never had I seen more than one or two Trabants at a time, and now it was a string of these little two-stroke, 25-horsepower engines going down the, smoke, the street with smoke puffing out the back like, like a poorly tuned lawnmower. I went out, I asked Lucy and said, can I go out and play? She said, all right. So I went out drinking with all these East Germans that night, and if they were nice, I would give them five mark notes. If they were attractive, they got ten marks. I ended up emptying my wallet just drinking with these people who until a day before had been the enemy, and now, of course, were, were no longer the enemy at all. The wall would, of course, never be the same, but you can see when I was here, we were able to actually go out and make some real chunks ourselves so that the piece of the wall I have, I can guarantee, is a real certified piece because it was, they were just lying all over them. I didn't even have to take out a little hammer or anything. My chunk is about this big. Now in Berlin, they still sell these beautifully colored pieces of the wall, and I imagine, yeah, they're pieces of a wall, but not necessarily the one that separated Berlin back 30, 40 years ago. And what became of my home, the place where I became an adult in this business, it didn't turn out much better than the wall, although sadly nobody's even thought of burying it, I'm afraid. This is what Teufelsburg looks like as of a week ago Saturday, taken from the Olympic Stadium Tower. To say that it's a shadow of its former self is to be way too polite. Lucy and I walked through its ruins in 2012, and some young group has decided to take ownership of the ruins of the site. They put up a little fence, and you have to pass through them and pay them to gain access to the site. Well, I'm not normally like this, but I, in my mind, said, I'll be damned if I'm going to do that. And so, as the guy wanted to haul, he said, hug, 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 you know, you've got to pay five euros to come in. I said, five euros? He said, yeah, but you get a guided tour for that. I said, no. You pay me 10 euros and I'll give you a guided tour. I was stationed here for seven years. It was like the Pied Piper of Hamlin. All these little East German, uh, German kids and young people following me as we wandered through the building. But little did I know that once I got up to my old operations area, I could tell them stories, but there was certainly nothing to point to. There was nothing but the cement foundation there. They had questions like, was it true you could listen to every phone call from Moscow from here? 
What do you think? How many calls are made in Moscow every moment, do you think? I said, no, no, we set our sights a little bit closer than that, okay? Uh, it is sad to see the place like that. Field Station Augsburg in Bavaria did a little bit better. It had the huge Wallenweber Flare 9 antenna, which is still used by the German government today, so that place looks pretty good. But unfortunately, Berlin, this, like so many other sites in West Berlin, is just a, a shadow of its former self. I want to end just by reading the way the, uh, the book ends here. Because I think it's safe to say that all of us who served there left there with a feeling of loss and with a feeling that something, something would never quite be the same, I think, uh, in our lives. It's no doubt safe to say that many of my high school buddies and college fraternity brothers ended up with careers bringing them far more money than I could ever know, leading to fancy homes and luxurious cars and all sorts of other accoutrements of the good life. Naturally, there are others who have not fared so well. I imagine I fall somewhere in the middle, at least in terms of earnings and creature comforts. But being surgeons or architects or lawyers or stockbrokers, fine and honorable positions all, those friends would never have had the opportunities I did to spend seven years in the bastion of freedom or the sentinel of security, as the army described the walled city, doing my tiny part as a cold warrior. I, like the thousands who served before, with, or after me in Berlin, were all part of one of the most remarkable and satisfying experiences anyone could ever dream of. In 1975, I believed I was going to end up as the translator, the interpreter between the U.S. president and the premier of the Soviet Union. In the summer of 1989, I would have predicted the wall would be standing long after I left the scene. This, by the way, is why I never play the lottery or shoot craps in Vegas. Here in 2019, however, with the luxury of hindsight and the blessing of a fairly strong memory, who says that beer kills brain cells, I know just how right I am when I say that I was blessed to have made a couple of lucky choices which resulted in what has turned out to be a long, fulfilling career. I've been in this business nonstop since 1975, probably holding 20 different positions over the span of my career. There is no doubt that the two tours of duty spent in Berlin find themselves at the top of the list of best jobs. I was so very fortunate to be able to serve my country in this small way and hope that I, like all of my crazy FSB friends, am not incorrect in saying that what we all did mattered. It mattered then, and I really do believe it still matters today. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the brave new world of Berlin, this is what the Brandenburg Gate looks like today. You cannot drive through it, but you can walk through it. And let me just close by offering a word of thanks to the many people who have either made this possible, made my life possible, or made many of the episodes that happened in this book possible. It truly is a remarkable story, and I've been thrilled to have been able to recount it for you here today and in a book form. And if any of you are interested in buying a copy of the book, I'll be glad to uh, autograph it for you. It costs $20, and I figured with that autograph in there, you figure the value of that book has just gone up to at least... $20.40, I'm so it's, it's definitely a bargain. But I thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I hope I've been able to take you on a stroll down memory lane that was as vivid for you as it, as it is for me. And thanks very much for taking the time and trouble to be here. Thank you. Let's thank him. Uh, take some questions. Uh, please put up your hand if you'd like the microphone. Because we would like to get this uh, on the bill. Uh, so, anybody got questions? Questions? Anyone? Oh, yes, there's John. Uh, you know, I've been a keeper several times during the program and so on, but uh, if you think what you should was there, when did you go on? When was I in Berlin last? No, no, it's keeper last. Uh, well, that picture was taken eight days ago, but I was actually in the building in 2012. Oh, okay, because I've seen some real close-up pictures of the antennas and stuff now, and they are really terrible. Yeah. These were taken about two years ago. And, uh, it was just amazing what happened to that picture. We withdrew all of the equipment that was there and found other uses for it, and a friend of mine at NSA a technical guy did work with an ally of ours out not too far from the Middle East and said he was shocked when he saw one of the antenna things they were mounting and on the back it said, 
property a field station for Lynn. So apparently we found a way to reprocess some of this stuff and give it to some other allies. Yes, sir. In, uh, when uh, Reagan came to Berlin, a student from the Brandenburg Gate and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Do you have any insight whether he knew what was already going or because the wall came down two years later? Was there something that he would, might know about that that process had already begun? Well, there's lots and lots and lots of good history written about the year 1989, but I will, I will say this. It, it's probably true that the U.S., by outspending the Soviets, were able to help bankrupt them and they realized too late that they couldn't keep up, and so that was really the beginning of the end for them. But to be quite honest, knowing a lot of folks from the eastern countries that I got to meet in NATO and hearing their stories, to say that the wall fell because Ronald Reagan made it happen is to really be rather impolite to an awful lot of unbelievably brave eastern Europeans. Ronald Reagan was not out there in Leipzig on those Monday nights in September and October of 1989. Those people this close, remember Tiananmen Square, it happened a few weeks earlier. I, as a betting man, advised my boss, Bill Black at the time, I predict the same thing in East Germany. I absolutely predict the same thing. The East German government is no saints, and I really felt that it was going to happen. It did not, through sheer good luck. But not just in East Germany, but in many of the other countries, these people took huge huge chances to make these changes possible. So I think that uh, Ronald Reagan, no more than any of the rest of us, could possibly see what would happen two years later. It was simply the stars lining up at the right time, and thank God a few leaders deciding not to pull triggers. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, a quick question. Um, could you make any comments about how I find it different as a classified, you know, working a classified position under in the Army versus working a classified position in the NSA? Do um, you find the transition to be difficult or surprising in some way, or something like that? Well, the fundamental change was in my day in the Army, military people with clearances didn't have to have a polygraph. That has since changed. So I was in for a rude awakening when I had to take my first polygraph. Uh, especially since we knew about Mr. Hall, and especially since I was surrounded by people with access to classified information every day, I had touched top secret documents every day, and when they ask you questions like, you know, have you been involved in any espionage, <laughs> or do you know anything of the classified information sharing with people who aren't authorized, <laughs> every time I heard the word classified, unlike the average hire, like my wife who came from teaching school, those were just red flag words, and I, I could hear in those days the polygraph was like in Meet the Parents. You could hear the needle on the page. <laughs> and every time I opened my mouth to answer, I'd hear that needle going off the page and realize this is going to be a real, real long session. I'm the only person I know who couldn't even get through the polygraph, having a clearance, and, and get through the first time being hired at NSA. But in terms of the rules, the regulations, the policies, and everything else, the good news is, is that the U.S. military adheres to the exact same guidelines that we civilians do in terms of security and everything else. There is no um, air gap there whatsoever between civilian and military folks in terms of what they're authorized to do and not. Now the military has to take polygraphs like the rest of us. Um, so really, the transition was not very difficult. I went from being a German linguist to being a Russian linguist again. That's what NSA needed. So I had to really brush up on my Russian. But doing transcription, doing that type of work, we simply had computers in 1980, such as they were. Um, that was really the only transition, was getting used to these things called computers. Anybody else? All right, let's thank Rick. Thank you. If anybody wants to buy a copy of the book,